Okay, so a literal, um, as you all, are, all of you know, it's either a variable or it's negation. So, and uh, the, uh, these junctions uh, are, uh, these disjunctions of k-literals are called clauses. So this is the terminology, and so we are all familiar with k-set. Let me know if you are not. Uh, being computer scientists, probably we are. Um, so now I define again, and this slide was also there uh, yesterday, so the f of a k-set instance, which is just the same as the maximal degree of uh, the underlying hypergraph. So each clause is like a set of k variables, and so the clauses sort of form a hypergraph on the variable set, and the, and the f is just the maximum degree of that hypergraph. So the, the maximum number of clauses um, that ever covers a, variable, a single variable. And so, um, so what, we, what we are interested in, so we assume that if f of phi is really small, for instance, it's one, then the formula is clearly satisfiable. So we are interested in the small, in the, in the largest uh, f uh, such that um, we can still conclude that the formula is satisfiable. So if, if phi, so we are interested in what is the maximum L such that if phi has, uh, F phi is L, then the formula is still satisfiable. So we, are, uh, we have also talked about this, um, uh, we talked about this last time, and we said that F3 was equal to three, for instance. So every three set instance, such that every variable occurs in at most three clauses, is satisfiable, but there is an example, and it's not, too easy. It's not so easy to come up with this example on uh, uh, three set instances uh, that have um, at most, uh, every variable is in at most four clauses, which is not satisfiable. Um, and I have even, so I, I'm giving you as an exercise, it's, I mean, probably you can do it, but it requires um, thinking. Um, By three set instance, you mean that each clause must contain exactly three? Well, so that's a very good point. Thank you very much. So, like yesterday, there was this uh, interview, and they asked, so what do I think, how clever you are? And I said, well, you are, I think you are very clever. And it shows, I, so indeed, I forgot to say that uh, every, um, every clause contains exactly three different variables. Well, variables order negation, or in general for k set, exactly k different variables order negations. Um, and that's important because, as you noticed, that if it's like x1 or x1 or x1, uh, then, of course, it's very easy to just to do everything, I mean, just with two, uh, but that's a cheating. Um, so here it's an example with eight, but again, your, your exercise would be to do it with four. Um, now, I'm just asking you that, so what is your, what is your guess that um, so I promise you, like I, I give you a, a three-set instance, and I promise you that no variable will occur in more than four clauses. So I promise you, I give you such an instance. So is, and, and now the question is, is that instance satisfiable or not? So what is your guess? Is it, is it going to be a hard problem, or is it an easy problem? Well, actually, maybe that's a stupid question since you have to make a wide guess. That's just completely nonsensical. Um, I don't know why there is a timer. So, 
I just have to shut off the timer. I guess. Wait, what's going on? <coughs> well, never mind. If uh, <laughs> if it goes again, I will do something. Okay. So, or where was it? Uh, okay. So. Um, okay. So the answer is that even if so, so even under this promise, the instance is going to be hard. And in general, if, if I am, so I know that if um, every variable is contained in exactly F or, or at most FK clauses, then the instance is always satisfiable. But if I go to FK plus one, and no more, so I promise you that every variable is contained in no more than fk plus one clauses, then all of a sudden it becomes mp hard. So there is not like a smooth transition from like being easy and then p hard, but as long as we just go, so if this uh, maximum degree just goes above what guarantees all the uh, satisfiability, then all of a sudden the problem becomes MP hard. Now that was just an aside. I just, uh, that, but that was a research problem and someone solved it and that's why I mention it. Um, okay, so, but, so what do we know about this FK? And that was still presented last time, except maybe the, the, upper bound. So F3 was 3, F4 was 4, but already we don't know what F5 is, and that's a research problem, whether F5 is 5, 6, or 7, and F6, and further, we even know less than that. Now, what comes from the Lovas local lemma is a lower bound similar to graph coloring, uh, hypergraph coloring. So recall that in hypergraph coloring, if you had two to the k divided by e k minus one, so if, if the maximum degree was, um, was less or equal than this, then the graph was too colorable. Now, just thinking very quickly through the proof, where does this plus one, where is this plus one coming from compared to the hypergraph colorability problem? Now, if you, if you remember our mantra, like what we always had to do, then, okay. sorry? Well, exactly. So, because in the hypergraph coloring, there were two bad configurations, and so the probability that a, a hyper edge is badly colored was two to the, well, two divided by two to the k. And here, that a clause is not satisfied is just one over two to the k. There is a single assignment which unsatisfies a clause. All the other assignments satisfy the clause. So, so it's very easy to satisfy a k-set clause uh, with probability one minus one over two to the k, you do that. And, um, and so then you remember that the Lovas local lemma was just simply you had to multiply this probability with the degree, but the degree notion is the same here as in the hypergraph case, so everything else is the same. And so that plus one is just that factor of two that comes in. Uh, so, uh, but now we also have an upper bound, and you guess that even for three, it's not easy to construct an, an instance um, which is not satisfiable yet. Every variable is contained in small number of clauses. So for general K, it's actually it's a very tricky construction and is due to Gebauer's uh, Sabo 
and Pardos. Uh, and so you see that the upper and lower bounds, at least when k go to, goes to infinity, then they are, uh, well, in order, they are the same. That is, they are the same within 1 plus little order of 1, a factor of 1 plus little order of 1. So it was a great job uh, from these three persons to actually match the upper and lower bounds. Um, but there is still a gap, and of course for small numbers, because this is just when k is large, like for small numbers we see that there is this tantalizing gap between uh, the upper and lower bounds. Um, so now I, I am just using this excuse of tightening this little gap even more um, to give you a like, kind of research problem. And also, um, and also talk about a version of the Lovas low column. So I'm using this as an excu excuse for both. So, um, so let's just revisit the original, the very first version of the Lovas low column. So what was it? Well, again, you have heard it 100 times that if every event is independent of all, but at most uh, the others, and if every probability is less than uh, 1 over e times e plus 1, I mean the uh, probability of every event, then we can avoid all of these events. So that's the Lovas low column. But you see that this, and it's very nice and simple, and it contains only the, um, just one thing, well, it, two things, the probability, of course, and the D. However, um, no, there are sets of events with different dependency graphs, like the uh, two extremes is when you have the clique where uh, like D uh, events are, uh, so here D equals 4, D events are all dependent of each other, and here there is maybe a very large graph where D is also 4, but it looks like, let's say locally, it looks like a 3. Like for instance, it's a huge expander graph. So is there a difference between these graphs? So can we like, uh, can we state a stronger Lovas low column, which actually takes the structure of this dependency graph into consideration? Um, so you might say, well, we have learned another Lovas low column, right? The standard, we call it the standard Lovas low column, which looked more sophisticated, that there, like, we could change the, the probabilities, we could it could be different, and also the dependency graph uh, uh, played the role in that Lovas low column. However, if we are looking at a regular graph, then uh, with the same probabilities, then actually that uh, what we call the standard Lovas low column does not give anything better than the original Lovas low column. That's easy to see, actually. So the standard Lovas low column is not of any help. So in order to, um, okay, so now let's, let's create a research project. Um, so we want to improve on this F, on this FK, right? And, um, so if we could do two things, like, um, like first, if we could say that the, that the that a case at instance, the dependency graph for a case at instance where like F phi, so this maximum degree is F phi, so 
the actually the dependency graph has degree d, right? Because k times or or k times f phi minus one is like that's the number of neighboring clauses to a clause, right? So as you see, you lose a one because of itself. Um, so this is the number of neighboring clauses. But can it look like locally like a tree, like a tree of degree d? So that's, that's one question. So can we say something about the structure of the dependency graph? And the other question is um, that is there a more precise Lovas local lemma that exploits the structure of dependency graph more? Of course, some of these questions, as a matter of fact, both questions are answered. And yet, of course, the project is still not completed. So let's see. Um, so first, the structure of the dependency graph of K set. So is it locally like a degree D3? Well, it is not. Because notice that, well, how it locally looks like, like if you look at well, these neighbors, like they form a clique because these neighbors are all containing this variable. Right? So these form, so the, so the neighbors are actually are, are coming in groups of size f phi minus one, where each group is a clique. So it looks like more like a clique tree, uh, or maybe not even a clique tree, but certainly it's like this union of cliques. So we can say something more about the structure of this graph, of the dependency graph. Now, the other uh, question is if we can say something more about the Lovas local lemma or something sharper than one of those two versions we have learned? And the answer is yes. Not only yes, but there is this ultimate, like, super Lovas local, well, it's not Lovas anymore, but it's super local lemma. As a matter of fact, I should tell you, it's neither Lovas nor local, <laughs> but it's a lemma. <laughs> uh, because, okay, so, so here is the problem, and I would like to work out, I mean, I just would like to, to just take a look at this problem with you a little bit. Um, so here I'm giving you the dependency graph, and, um, and uh, there is like a, so I say that the dependency graph together with the vector of probabilities, um, well, it's good if, you know, if, if, those vac if those probabilities and the dependency graph together, like, imply the Lovas local lemma condition, meaning that, like, in every setting, if the dependency graph is that, and if the, if the probabilities are that, then we know that the probability of intersection AIs are greater than zero. And so in that case, we write that this sequence of probabilities belong to the shearer, um, the shearer, um, it's kind of a, it's not a polytope, it's like a body of um, uh, uh, associated with G. So actually, let me um, maybe draw a picture, and maybe I should go up here, because in the next, like, like so here, I don't know whether it's anything visible. So, so here, like you have this corner, and so here you have a G, a graph G, and so each coordinate direction corresponds to a node of G. And so these are the probability values. Uh, so these are the P vectors such that if, um, well, let's say this is G, so if, Let's say I have a fourth or, well, three tuple in this case. Um, so G has now just three 
nodes, so the probability vector P1, P2, and P3. So if I am inside here, then I should then uh, uh, I should be able to conclude. So this means that the, like the probability of A1 is P1, so the probability of A2 is P2, and the probability of A3 is P3. And so I want to conclude that so in this, it always holds that if this is the dependency graph, then uh, the probability of uh, A1 complement intersect, A2 complement intersect, AC complement is greater than zero. So, uh, so that's, so then, so then this polytope, or whatever this body is called, the uh, SH of G for, let's say, this graph G. Um, so what I want to work out with you is to compute uh, this, this set of vectors for certain Gs, right? For instance, if I am looking at, let's say, this, what is going to be the set of vectors? So now here, P1 and P2. So I want to conclude that no matter, uh, so someone gives me two events, and this edge means they can be dependent, so two events that can be dependent, but if the probabilities are P1 and P2, then I should be able to conclude that I can avoid both events. So what uh, would be then the, those P1, P2 vectors for which this holds? So simply P1 plus P2 is, is less than 1. Right? This, this is true for every, in every setting. Right? How, about, how about, uh, this graph? P1, P2. So what would be the, so what would be the ve set of vectors. Each of them less than one. So each of them, like P1 and P2, I mean, so both are less than one, well, and greater than zero, well, less than one, let's see. Okay, so how about this? P1, P2, P3, right? So now, we, so now for every set of events that obey this dependency structure, it must hold that as long as the numbers are as you describe, hopefully you describe, then we can always avoid all of the events. So what is going to be the set of those triplets. Okay, so P1 plus P2 less than 1. P1 plus P3 less than one. So all of you agree with this? Well, this is certainly as a necessary condition for the triplet. But if in every, in every case when this holds, can we conclude this?
Well, let's try to find a counterexample. I right, saw. So, um, So let me, um, let's see, let me create two events. Like, so first I am creating the events P2 and P3 such that they are independent. Right? So I am creating a P2, I mean A2 and A3. So A2 and A3 are going to be independent. So let's say I am taking this as 1 over 4, 1 over 4, 1 over 4. Right. And then I have, um, and so now if I am, now I have A, which, which, so A1, right, which can depend on, on any of those, like I, uh, so it's like 1 over, let's say I'm making it 1 over 3, or actually, I can even stretch it to 1 over 4, which kind of be the, so this, this would be the A3, IA1, right? They fill up the entire space, right? So, and I did not even use, I did not even go up to the bounds here. It's just 1 over 4, 1 over 4, and 1 over 4 plus, one, uh, two, plus 2 over 4, right? So it's just 3 quarter, and this sum is also 3 quarter. And if I go, I, and, and I already filled up the entire space. So this by itself, under this condition, does not, don't, does not guarantee this. Yes? So that's correct. So actually, one might say it this way. That so, uh, or or yeah. So so uh, P1 plus uh, P2 plus P3 minus P2 times P3 uh, has to be uh, less than one. So why is that the correct answer? So it's just the union, right? So first I am creating these two events, and I know that these two events have a union exactly this, and and this is the only assumption that these two have to be independent. And then, uh, but then, like my enemy or whoever creates this adversarial setting can just, well, just, just put A1 disjointly from these. So, so we have to make sure that this P1 plus this expression is less than 1. Right, so let's do a <clears throat> last example where um, just let me make an experiment to see if, but does it make it better a little or it does not? Better. Um, so, um, so let's try now this graph. So that's A1, A2, A3, A4, and with probabilities P1, P2, P3, and P4. Right? And so now, um, and so now my constraint, so the dependency graph says that these two have to be independent, and these two have to be independent. And the dependency graph has no other constraints. So what would be the four tuples of probabilities that would lie 
in this region. Sorry? Okay, so you are right. Um, so it's P1, let me write it this way, P1 plus P2 minus P1, P2 plus, so let me just write it this way, which is the same as what you are saying. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, you are right. P3 and here P3 and then P2 plus P4 minus P2, P4. And again, the reason for that is that, well, again, the enemy tries to construct an example which, like, um, which says, so the enemy says that, well, you know, I can construct a setting in which actually these events fill up the entire space. But so how, can, so how can this enemy go about? Well, it can first construct A1, A3 like this, and then can construct like A2 and A4. And of course, the enemy would be stupid to have any intersection between these, because these would just you know, shrink the total because the goal of the enemy is to fill up the entire space. So if this is the entire space, then, well, this, is, this expresses exactly the size of this union, and this expresses the size of this other union, and so the sum of the two has to be less than one, and then the enemy is doomed. Right? So, um, so this is, so this is uh, the expression, but of course, in general, it's not a single inequality, but it's a more complicated thing. And so Shearer just determined exactly for general graphs, like which tuples for, fall in this region. So let me give you that here. Okay, so... Um, and so these were the examples I should have. Uh, um. so, so what Shearer noticed is that there is always an extreme instance. And this extreme instance actually plays a great, great role in understanding uh, this ultimate Lovas local lemma. So what Shearer noticed is that in the extreme instance, like when two events are connected by an edge in the dependency graph, then they are always, they are always disjoint. So because, you know, the enemy wants to put like the events as far apart from each other as possible, but of course, if they are independent, then they, then they, have, to be an inter they have to have an intersection, which is the product of the two probabilities. But if, they are, if there is an edge, then the enemy just can push those events. Well, of course, one has to prove that, but can push those events uh, like to be independent. And so now, if I know that, the, that whenever there is an edge, then the, in the extreme case, the two events are disjoint, then I can just determine the probability of all intersections like this. Why is that? I mean, so this intersection meaning that I just take any number of AIs, and so what is the intersection size of those? Um, well, uh, if there is like any AI and AJ, such that there is an edge between them, then that already makes this, this intersection the zero, like empty set, right? Because 
like if A1 and A, if AI1 and AI2, the intersection is already the empty set. So if there is an edge, then because of this observation, then if there is an edge, then the intersection is already the empty set. Then, well, I can add more intersections. It's still going to be the empty set. So if there is an edge at all between the I, I case and I, these I case or whatever the indices, then 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 this intersection has zero probability. But if there is no edge at all, this means that this is an the the I one I two I L is an independent set in the dependency graph. But if it's an independent set in the dependency graph, it means that all those events are independent. And so then the probability of this intersection then ought to be simply the product. So actually, since I can tell all, the pro all these probabilities um, uh, and for the system of events, A1 through AN, like all the intersections, that's, that's uh, 2 to the um, uh, uh, 2 to the n uh, pieces of information. So it's well known that actually these are independent pieces of information that you can recover from this the um, well, given let given the probability of AIs, I can recover like all probabilities from that. So using that, this observation, then Shearer worked his way uh, towards finding the formula. And, um, and I'm not giving you the derivations. It's actually it's not that easy, but it's not very hard either. But um, I, I am giving you his theorem. So for his theorem, you need to know the notion, which you need to know maybe anyways, because it's a, it's a beautiful notion, but not only that, but because if you ever want to do physics, then this formula will, uh, will occur, um, is the notion of independent set polynomial. So the independent set polynomial for a graph G is the following. Just take all possible independent sets of G, and the, polynom well, the polynomial has as many variables as the number of nodes of G. And for each independent set of G, you just take the product of those variables associated with the nodes of G, uh, those nodes of, G of this independent set. So you take every independent set, each independent set gives you a product, and you just sum these products. So that's the independent set polynomial of G. Now, if you have ever seen partition function in physics, then this is, um, well, basically, uh, at least for the hardcore lattice gas model, so this is the partition function. Uh, um, so Shearer's theorem says the following, that if this Q is the independent set polynomial of, of the graph G, and P is a vector of probabilities that, like here, like we associate with the nodes of G, each node of G a, like a one of PIs, so now when is this vector pi is going to be in this Shearer domain? Um, it is going to be if and only if we take like any vector q, which is coordinate wise less or equal than p, you, we plug in this q, actually the minus of that, into the and it's important, this minus is important, into the independent set polynomial, because obviously if we plug in, and then so that 
And so that gives us a number greater than zero. So if we just plug the Q, then that's obviously it's greater than zero because all the terms of the independent set polynomial are positive. But if, uh, but if we take the minus Q, then what happens is that if with even size uh, independent sets is going to be positive and with, with odd size it's, these are going to be negative. So, so here this is the condition and actually this condition, this Shearer condition, it's like a much uglier condition than um, the, Lovas, the simple condition of the Lovas local lemma. Um, but you can still calculate it in many cases. For instance, the, like a large tree um, or for the clique, and it gives better value than the, um, than the, just the standard LLL. Not only that, but because this, because mathematicians have studied this so much, then physicists started to, started to think that, okay, so these guys have done a lot of work, and here is the same, as, and, and actually physicists need the exact same condition in their partition function, so they started to look at what the mathematicians are doing, and Scott and Sokal, who are physicists, they wrote a 70 pages paper which uses known facts about the Lovas local lemma and these studies to get conclusions in physics. So here is a, is a connection to physics, and that's actually, that's, that's, that's also a sort of a broader research problem to further understand the connection of Lovas local lemma to this uh, repulsive uh, lattice gas model. So what we get, for instance, is like the standard LLL for, uh, so here we see that the standard LLL for every n regular graph, and actually this n maybe it should, I should call it d, really. So for every d regular, for, well, for every d regular graph, the standard LLL just gives one over d times e, but if it's a clique, then clearly the answer should be just one over d. For the bipart for the bipart for the d d bipartite graph, again, it's kind of it just gives the same. But this is the truth, and if you are saying, oh, well, this is very different from this, actually, this is not so different from this. So this is within a constant factor, but still it has a better constant than 1 over e. For, for general deregular graphs, the standard LLL, even in the, uh, for the worst deregular graph, which is actually turns out to be the, just the tree, the infinite branching like deregular tree or maybe st you stop at a large radius, the standard LLL does not even give the best bound. It just gives this. So actually in the standard LLL we can improve a little bit uh, this E to, to this. So, but it's always, it's usually stated like this and not this. But still, even for that graph, the shearer gives the true bound, which is this, uh, and so forth. So these are, again, so I forgot to say that these are the bounds. So how large P can be that we are still within this, and assume that on every node now, we, so all the no, on all the nodes, we are writing the same number P. So how large can it be that we are still in this region? And so these are the numbers. So I, I Forgot to say the interpretation, I apologize. Um, so, so Shearer is the best. So it, it seems like now this is our mellow music moment again because now we really know the ultimate Lovas bound, like we know everything. So now we just really tune ourselves out 
and just just relax. Um, so, but we never relax because we are mathematicians, so we are nervous that maybe some other mathematicians are proving better theorems than us, so we still want to do something better. Right? So, how can we do better than Shearer, I mean, if this is the ultimate bound? Um, well, um, it seems we cannot because this is the end of this, the end of this slideshow, but um, actually I did not check the time. Um, it's quite amazing. Um, okay, so actually it's just about time. So okay, so in the next, in the next talk, so that's perfect timing because this is the end of this talk, right? And the next talk starts in 10 minutes, so I tell you how you can do nevertheless better.